Hello, my name is John Garbutt. I'm a principal engineer at Stack HPC. And today I'm going to talk to you about the project we've been doing at Cambridge University, which is expanding their CST3 supercomputer um, with some new hardware and making use of OpenStack to do that. So a little bit of context on CST3. It's the Cambridge service for data-driven discovery. It's got a mixture of um, regular CPUs, Intel Xeon CPUs, um, Intel KNL and uh, NVIDIA GPUs. When it was first installed, um, roughly about November 2017, um, it was one of the fastest UK supercomputers and it was in fact top seven, it was number 75 in the world um, in the top 500 list. CST3 has always been, um, so far has been provisioned using XCAT. So effectively you take a running machine, you create an image from that node, then that image is pushed out to all the other nodes um, using XCAT um, via, effectively via pixie rooting the machine and pushing the image down. And all the resources within the system are accessed via um, a Slurm cluster. So a batch queue that you submit your work, your jobs to. So there's some reasons that they wanted to change the way they're currently working when they're looking to when they're looking to expand the cluster. The first one really is as, an, uh, as many people have is an increasing complexity. Um, there's always more different more platforms that people want to run, um, people wanting to self-service their needs, um, and this they need some help managing all of this complexity that's coming along as things get. You know, more and more diverse and what the, the workloads that need to be supported within the cluster. At the same time, um, this is causing problems with knowledge sharing as they're looking to use automation infrastructure as a infrastructure as code tooling to try and manage the complexity and help with this resource sharing. So using peer review and checking thing, you know, having a Git repository with a good history telling you why things happened uh, in the past but applying this to infrastructure. Another part of this is um, removing resource silos. So the moment when hardware is purchased, it usually gets a specific platform on it and it's often stuck with that for its lifetime. That can look a bit like this. So for the traditional HPC stack 1.0, you have different silos of hardware for different use cases. So there's a, a silo that's good for Hadoop, and there's a silo that's good for AI and deep learning. There's a silo that does traditional HPC, and these are often quite separate. Now the hardware is getting more similar between all these things, and people in each of these buckets are wanting hardware from the other one. It's getting increasingly complicated to try and uh, deal with all the shifting hardware needs, oh, all the different resource requests over time. So what we're looking to do is to bring in OpenStack to help with that. So you have this single pool of bare metal and hardware resources, but we want to expose them through a, a single set of APIs. So whether you want uh, bare metal or VMs or containers, you can come to OpenStack and spin those up and on that run your science platform. In addition, they're also trying to look at uh, building these science platforms in a more sort of uh, cloud native way, um, such that when it when there's resource needs that that can't be met locally because the system is fully used and then there's the option um, to move those workloads that can move to external clouds where it's generally more expensive to to run there but that time can be used if that if that's uh, a good use of money one of the key things that um that we're doing here is to use an ironic to enable those bare metal workloads so we're looking particularly in this talk at how we expand the CSD3 partition with new nodes using OpenStack Ironic. So let's just take a moment to have a look at Cambridge's, uh, the Cambridge High Performance Computing Services OpenStack journey. It started roughly back in 2015. Um, they're one of the founding members of the sort of resurgence of the uh, OpenStack um, scientific SIG. And, you know, they've been doing a lot of work telling the world, you know, telling the 
the Opus, you know, the Opus Stack community and the world what they've been doing um, and, and what they need Opus Stack to do and trying to make that happen. In particular, um, using the SKA and its need for a, a, a uh, performance prototype platform and seeing how you could use OpenStack bare metal to do that. Um, but actually, if you look more widely at what Cambridge have done, there's a whole uh, loads of varying different use cases. So there's uh, virtualized clouds and uh, bare metal clouds, although they all generally have a, a specific, a, a sort of a slightly specific flavor. Whereas we come to the, the new cloud that's been created to expand CSD3, that's uh, got the name Arcus. And this is an attempt to create a more unified cloud. And the particular use case that we haven't been able to satisfy until now is actually to be able to look at large scale HPC. So can the main cluster um, that, Opus, that Cambridge are using be deployed using OpenStack? So this is the expanding of CSD3 using OpenStack. So first, these some notes on the hardware. We're using Dell PowerEdge um, C6420 servers. That's sort of basically you get four dual socket um, machines within a 2U footprint. Um, for the sake of this talk, let's just talk more about the networking. Uh, well, there is a local SSD, um, and there's a one gig NIC for the that can be dedicated for the outbound management network. Now, this actually also can be um, optionally visible inside the OS. Uh, the main networking for the system is a Menelux Connect X6 card. One of the ports is used as a um, HDR100 port, so the HDR200 switch with a breakout cable with two HDR100s per switch port, and a very similar set up for Ethernet, where the Ethernet 100 gig switch has a breakout cable for two ports, each one being 50 gig. So there's a 100 gig infinite band and 50 gig Ethernet on every one of those um, servers. So job number one was finding the machines. Cambridge have quite a well um, practiced path in which they discover the servers, where there's a basically once it's racked and stacked, then they they scan the information using a handheld scanner and that gets exported into some spreadsheets. So you can generate a CSV file that shows what you expect to be in the rack. So what we want to do is take that CSV file and automate everything from that, from that point onwards. One of the key pieces of information that CSV, um, CSV file is the uh, MAC address for the out of band management port. In this particular case, we use Neutron to hand out the IP address to the outbound management network. And this port isn't actually bound, but the Neutron DHP server still happily hands out the IP address to the Mac that requests it. Um, so we create, use Terraform actually to create those ports from the CSV file. Um, and then we generate an Ansible inventory from that same CSV file. And that Ansible inventory is used to uh, basically do all the automation from this point onwards. So as soon as possible, we get the node enrolled into Ironic. The first step is actually to enable IPMI so that we can actually add the node into Ironic. So we want to use the IPMI driver. We'll come on to more about that, about that later. Um, so we enable IPMI, then we enroll it into Ironic. Now we basically use Ironic to track this machine throughout its enrollment state. Um, so in order to get the machine fully functional, we actually have to configure in band um, the ConnectX6 NIC. And we actually do this inside the inspection RAM disk. So when it first boots from the inspection RAM disk, it checks the state of the ConnectX6 NIC. If it's not what's expected, it updates the NIC, updates the firmware, tells them, tells the NIC which port should be Ethernet, which port should be InfiniBand, and then reboots and then does the inspection. So now from this inspection, we should have most of the information about the node. Um, and then we, in fact, actually what we do is we change the BIOS settings to start to disable the one gig NIC and start pixie booting over the 50 gig um, ethernet NIC. Um, now that's available. And then once that's, uh, once that's all configured, then we do an inspection again over the 50 gig ethernet and that updates the pixie MAC address and all the other data 
so that we're then ready to image the machine. So building up the Slurm cluster, creating the Slurm cluster, we're using Terraform. Um, we're actually using that same CSV file that says, um, this is the hardware name, and this is the logical cluster name. Um, so the hardware name is the ironic node name, and the logical cluster name is the name of the Nova instance that we create to sit on that specific bare metal node. So we actually use the AZ mapping to target a specific bare metal node. A key part of the image based deploy is that when the image boots on the server, um, the cloud in it as usual via config drive, it, um, gives the server the correct name, host name, and IP address. But from that point, it then mounts an FS share, which gets the Slurm configuration and Slurm starts up and just joins the main existing CSD3 Slurm cluster. So we've got all these OpenStack powered nodes rejoining the, um, the main Slurm cluster. This, the main Slurm cluster having had its configuration updated to include these new expected nodes. As an aside, um, the idea is to use Ansible for, well, we are using Ansible for the image build process as well as ad hoc changes to try and keep these two things in, in sync. Now, in terms of rebuilding the nodes, once the cluster is up, um, it's quite common for monthly or whenever the next vulnerability is found to have to re um, to update the kernel. And obviously any of the vulnerabilities in the stack in the packages installed on the system, often it's cleaner just to re-image the node. So we really need to do that um, without interrupting the operation of the system. Now, when they do this with XCAT, what they do is they change the Pixie boot server to start handing out a new image. And that means that when any of the nodes reboot, they just pick up they pixie boot in and get get the new image and reboot back um, out of that. What we've done for OpenStack is that we've actually got a custom Slurm reboot script. So when the reboot command is sent, the reason basically includes a string that includes the and um, the fact that we want an OpenStack reimage opt into it, and this is the image UID to reimage on. And so this script actually uses the instance UID from, um, from config drive, well, from cloud init, and it uses that and the image ID that the user specified to re-image, to send the re-image API command to OpenStack. And that's actually what reboots the node and goes through all of the ironic process to clean, you know, to, to re rebuild and re-image the node. And that's proven to work really quite well. And um, we can, within about 20 minutes, re-image all um, 56 servers in a single rack. Um, now, we had to do make some changes to get there. So tuning Ironic for scale. So the main focus has been on this rebuild to apply a new kernel update and how to do that as quickly as possible. The first part, actually, was getting the networking working well. So we're using multi-tenant networking within Ironic. Um, in particular, we're using the networking generic switch driver. Um, we started off using the Ansible networking driver for the Cumulus switches, but this proved too slow. And we used a networking, moved to a networking generic switch driver, which actually has been contributed upstream and is now merged upstream in the latest release. Um, uh, the main reason that this driver seems to be faster was that it actually only does one uh, one commit of the switch config for every port update, whereas Ansible Networking was doing two commits, and that seemed to be where the, it was bottlenecking on the switch. Um, it's got about an order of magnitude faster. Um, it's taking about a thousand seconds to for the slowest ports to bind with Ansible Networking for a whole rack. It's taking about 300 seconds with this Cumulus driver. Uh, the advantage of the Cumulus driver also was that extra configuration on the ports, such as like, this is an edge port um, in terms of spanning tree configuration, all that configuration gets persisted and the description of the port, that doesn't get blown away, whereas Ansible Networking was actually deleting all of that information. Um, but anyway, we used Networking Check Switch and it didn't do that. Uh, one extra thing we developed was actually using etcd to batch up the requests. So basically when the request came in, we wrote, the, we wrote the request to change the switch config to etcd, and then 
every request that comes in sort of kicks off an async job to get all the latest requests, batch them together and submit them to the switch. And then, then it waits for the result. So anyway, with this mechanism, we're able to get the time down to reconfigure the switch to, to well under a minute to reconfigure the switch for the whole rec. And when you actually look at the, um, the port configurations that happen to happen during a rebuild process, you actually have to pull the port out of the tenant network and then put it into the provisioning network and pull it out of the provisioning network and back into the tenant network at the end. So speeding this up was a big help to the amount of time it took to re-image the node. Uh, when picking the driver, uh, we couldn't quite get the Redfish driver to work for some reason. Um, so we originally started with the iDRAC driver, but on closer inspection, um, when it set the Pixie boot mode, that was actually requiring a reboot to actually set the Pixie boot mode. So we moved back to just the simple IPMI driver um, and that avoided, effectively avoided an extra post cycle, which saved quite a bit of time. There's quite a bit of um, work deciding which deploy mechanism to use. Typically we've used iSCSI. Now this has been deprecated upstream, which also pushed us towards trying the direct deploy. In this case, we're using direct deploy using HTTP and not Swift, um, just because we don't have a very particularly high performance um, object store ready to use right now. Um, so it seemed sensible to use the HTTP method. Now, originally slipping to direct deploy, actually we saw a massive CPU increase in CPU usage in Ironic Conductor. Um, I tracked this down to the force raw images flag and we set that to false. Um, that went away. In part, not, I don't think, in part because of the image conversion, but actually the biggest problem was probably the um, using Python to check to check some of the image. Um, with, a, with the large images, that was taking a long time and all of the instances were doing it every time to check some. Anyway, force raw images false made a big difference. Uh, moreover, rather than when the IPA RAM disk is now pulling from the conductor, it can now pull the QCAM image, which is generally much smaller than what the raw image would be. Uh, so that saves, that saves more time in the data copy. Now this does move work from the conductors to all of the compute nodes, uh, but given we're trying to scale this out to lots of compute nodes, that's exactly what we want to do. Um, of course, the, the particular problem here is that we're forcing the case where we want to build all of this almost 700 nodes we want to rebuild well rebuild them all at once so that's really what's uh, causing this to be a, a problem now when we were looking at the cpu usage spiking for the ironic conductor process and the ironic conductor process was getting up to the process itself was getting up to about 100 percent cpu occasionally um, we turned off the power sink and that really did reduce the amount of cpu which gave more overhead but yeah once we get to direct deploy Maybe that was less relevant. We could probably we could maybe look at turning this back on, but um, certainly turning this off gave more CPU available. Now, there was a particularly um, tricky issue to debug when we were looking at this. There were lots of um, connection issues. At first, I was, I was fearful that actually downloading the image to the IPA RAM disk was actually interrupting the sort of normal communications to Rabbit, to the database, to Keystone, to Glance, to other things. I even actually added trying, there's a Glance retry parameter for Ironic, so increasing that, but that didn't really actually help the failures actually getting the Keystone token. Um, with a detailed look at HA proxy logs, and in particular looking at the documentation for the HA proxy logs, it turns out what was happening is we were hitting the connection timeout. So I believe this is the amount of time it takes for the connection to be established and for the request to be completed from the client. Um, I'm fairly sure this is related to Eventlet and its scheduling of the threads. I think what was actually happening is the connection was started, but then it took an awful long time before, um, it, basically various other, th lots of threads started their connections. And eventually it got back to the beginning where it got to finish its connection and send the rest of the request. Um, certainly we saw it raising the connection timeout from the default of 10 seconds or the default in color for 10 seconds up to about 30 seconds, got rid of all of these connection problems. The first time um, 
I bumped the connection HA proxy. We then started only seeing the database problems, but in a slightly different way. And on closer inspection, MariaDB has its own connection timeout, which we also bumped, which got rid of the database problems. I also tried to tweak, tweak the, um, the database connection pooling so that the, uh, the connection pool didn't grow quite so big. So there's more chance for it to actually deal with all the connections it had in flight. Um, but in reality, I think it's the connection timeouts that made all the big difference. Uh, one final thing when doing the server deletes in particular is where we actually saw some RPC timeouts. Things just taking slightly too long when all of the deletes all came in at once because um, there's no throttling on that. Um, increasing the timeouts got around that. I'm sure there was something more clever I could do, but that got us over the hump. So before I leave this topic, I think it's worth highlighting the monitoring. Uh, the monitoring really helped actually understand what on earth is going on. So we use the built-in uh, Prometheus support in Color Ansible alongside the uh, Fluent Elasticsearch and Commander to collect the logs and look at those across all the controllers. Um, and that worked really well to get visibility on what was happening on the controller nodes. In addition, we actually added some extra bits. Um, we actually ran Node Exporter on the Cumulus switches. This was particularly useful for um, uh, traffic flowing into iPixie and traffic flowing into the IPA RAM disk where we didn't really want to run a, an exporter. So we could actually get visibility into the traffic between all the compute nodes um, just by running Node Exporter on the Cumulus switch, and that worked surprisingly effectively. Another piece, we were using the Redfish exporter just to get hardware metrics. Um, in particular, there were lots of metrics about things like you know power cables getting knocked and various things. Um, I'm sure in main production, this will be much more useful. But in terms of bringing up the system, it was very useful in spotting some of the problems. And uh, some of the insights I was saying about like um, what was happening when Ironic Conduct was using maximum CPU, the Guru mediation reports were really useful in telling me exactly what all the event threads happened to be doing. We did see some issues with image download looking like it was stopping progress um, for other ironic conductor threads like the DB updates. Um, so as I just said that I actually tuned the uh, the amount of time it takes for an ironic conductor to, to think that the other ironic conductor is dead and redo the um, the ring just in case that the DB was busy. Um, but using the Guru mediation reports, you're actually able to see what all the event and threads were doing, which is really useful. So what's next? So going back to the original vision of having this one open stack to rule them all, so there's a single hardware pool. We're not there yet. Um, we've just Really, this work has proven that we can actually, for a large scale HPC, use OpenStack and use Ironic to provision it. That's worked really well. Um, but right now, we're kind of in this in the situation that half of the cluster is still using XCAT, and the new bits of the cluster are using OpenStack. Now, the old bits of the cluster, um, it, we could just let for all this hardware to age out. But I think it'd be nice to it may well make sense to move some of that into OpenStack, uh, just so we can. Uh, get the flexibility that we need between the different pieces. Uh, there's some work on SRV we'd like to do. Now we're using InfiniBand rather than OPA on the new cluster. We should be able to get um, RDMA inside the VMs using SRV. Uh, we have done this elsewhere. We just want to port this to the system. Um, it, building on all of that, we want to use uh, OpenStack Magnum deployed Kubernetes clusters to make use of all this, um, in particular targeting things like Horovod, where you've got distributed machine learning where you um, want an RDMA transport for low latency links between um, the GPUs that are attached in all the different VMs. And generally there's some loose ends around operational tooling. Uh, one particular one is we, one of the key things that we want to be able to do is if we've got this overcloud, um, Ironic, that has all of the Sloan cluster in, when some of those need to get converted to hypervisors to host VMs and various other things, we want to make that really easy to do, to be able to come to take the node out of the Slurm cluster. Um, that's a well-known thing, but we just want to be able easily to deploy the hypervisor on there um, rather than having to, um, currently you'd 
typically have to move the hypervisor, well, add, enroll that hypervisor in the Yfrost that we've been using to deploy hypervisors. But really, we should be able to directly use the um, yeah, the Ironic that's running within the cloud to deploy the hypervisors, if that's what makes sense, which it should do in this case. There's some bumps around networking, so we need to trunk VLANs down. There's no support for that in the NGS Cumulus, uh, the network NGX switch Cumulus driver, but I'm sure we can work our way around that one way or the other. But making this slick will uh, really help make that one open stack with a more vision, more of a reality. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I kind of hate thank you slides. I always feel like I missed one off. Um, but a big thank you to the OpenStack community. Loads of support through the Open Dev. And lots of just great discussions actually really helped with this work. Uh, particularly gave us a lot of confidence on the direction towards scanning. A lot of people do the scanning to scale, scale out bare metal stuff. Lots of great conversation with the folks at CERN on what they're doing. So it's a very similar use case. A great thanks to Cambridge University um, being such great partners to work with. And great thanks to all the, uh, the funding bodies that have funded this work. The link at the bottom of this slide is a sort of press release on the, the background of where this uh, particular expansion of CSD3 came from in the context of that funding. And also all the uh, industry partners and vendors that have worked to help support um, the sort of co-development and co-design of this project, so, you know, Dell, Intel, NVIDIA, Mellanox. Well, maybe they're the same thing now. Anyway, um, thank you very much, everyone, for listening.